Hello class, this is Dr. Lisa Kearney Anderson, and this is a recording to the PowerPoint I'll be showing in class. And the topic to be covered is uh, cellular aspects of endocrine physiology, which I call endocrine basics. I really like to base my lectures on learning objectives so that you know what's expected for the exam. So that's where I always start my lectures. So first, I want students to be able to compare and contrast steroid versus protein hormones. Now, different textbooks, uh, different instructors will divide hormones up into different categories. I like to think of them in two categories. Lipid soluble, the most common being the steroids, and water-soluble, the most common being the, the proteins. And here's how I want you to compare and contrast them. I want you to think about their chemistry. Um, what kind of molecules are they? I want you to think about where their receptors are located. I want you to think about how they travel in the blood. Do they need a carrier or not? I want you to think about how long they stay around, and we quantify that using something called the half-life. In other words, how long does it take for that amount of hormone to be degraded till it's half of what it used to be? And finally, I want you to be able to um, discuss and describe the intracellular mechanisms of actions for each type of hormone. Now, it's not just enough to increase and decrease hormone secretion. There has to be a response to the receptor very important that you realize hormones work through specific receptors. And when there are more receptors, a target tissue is more sensitive for the hormone. And when um, receptor number decreases, then the tissue is less sensitive. Finally, hormones interact with one another. And there are a number of ways hormones can interact. But I would especially like you to be able to define permissiveness and uh, give examples or recognize permissiveness when I describe it to you. So we start out, what in the world is a hormone? A hormone is a chemical substance secreted into body fluids, particularly the blood, by one cell or group of cells and has a physiologic control effect on other cells of the body via a specific receptor. So uh, I will ask the class to give examples uh, when we are talking in person. The key here is it's a chemical substance, it's carried in body fluids, and it has to do its job through a receptor. So we can think of two kinds of glands. We can think about um, glands that are exocrine glands and an exocrine gland has a duct, and it secretes its byproduct on top of an epithelial layer. So, for example, the salivary glands are uh, exocrine glands. Um, the uh, liver has a duct and secretes something called bile, and that's a secretory product. So you can think of, the, of aspects of the liver being an uh, exocrine gland. Um, the pancreas is an exocrine gland, but it's also a, the pancreas is a fascinating organ because not only is it an exocrine gland that releases digestive enzymes, but it also has aspects of being an endocrine gland. So endocrine glands produce hormones, and those hormones are secreted into the blood. At least the hormones we'll be talking about in this presentation. So what do hormones have in common? First of all, they're very potent. You only need a small amount of hormone to have a pretty significant effect um, because they engage in something called amplification. When the hormone binds to its receptor, then many, many processes are set off inside the cell. And one step leads to the production of 10 substrates, and then those 10 substrates go off and do something else to, to 10 other molecules. So you have a growing response inside the cell, and I will show you examples of that in a bit. 
Hormones regulate biologic functions. So hormones regulate metabolism. They regulate the kind of reactions that go on in cells. They regulate reproduction. They regulate water balance. They regulate blood glucose levels. So all kinds of biological functions, and they work through receptors. So for example, estrogen is a steroid hormone um, that binds to estrogen receptors. But the thing is, estrogen is really the category. There are some subtypes of estrogens, like estradiol, and estradiol, as a matter of fact, is the most common estrogen found in human females. There's also estriol or estrone. All of these are going to bind to estrogen receptors. They're not going to bind to testosterone receptors. They're not going to bind to insulin receptors. They're going to work specifically through their own type of receptor. So what about the steroids? Steroids have something in common in terms of their chemistry. They are all derived from cholesterol, and then they're secreted as you need them. Now, cause cholesterol and the steroids that come from them are lipid soluble, they don't dissolve in blood very well, and therefore they need to be carried in the blood by a carrier protein. And that carrier protein hangs on to that steroid as it travels through the blood. Now, Sometimes the carrier is going to unbind from the hormone, and the hormone can go into the liver and be broken down. However, that slows the process of break, breakdown um, very much. In a, in a sense, the protein carrier is shielding the hormone from degradation. What that does is extend the half-life of the steroids. So we think of steroids as long-lasting. We also think of them as slow-acting, and I'll get to that in a bit. So here's a figure from the textbook Vander showing uh, different kinds of steroids. So um, here's the molecule, molecule cholesterol. So it's a series of rings, and then it's got some side chains here. Now, cortisol is our stress hormone. Uh, it's an example of what we call a glucocorticoid. And you see it's got those four rings, but the side chains are different. Aldosterone is another steroid. It's in a category we call mineral corticoids uh, because they have effects on, on salt reabsorption. Again, we see the four rings, but the side chains are a little bit different. Testosterone is the, uh, an example of male androgens. And uh, again, we have four rings and side chains that are different. Testosterone actually can be converted into estradiol. So estrogens are another example of uh, one of the uh, six classes of steroid hormones. And we have um, our four rings and different side chains. What I find fascinating about estradiol is that this last ring is an aromatic ring. You see how the, the uh, double bonds vary every other side. Um, so there's a lot of discussion about molecules with aromatic rings that act like estradiol and have consequences for um, the animal kingdom uh, in terms of their reproduction and survival. Um, um, perhaps you've read about the concept of endocrine disruptors. Those are things that um, can act like estrogen. Uh, we have two other categories that are not shown. Uh, we don't have examples of molecules, but the progestins are the fifth category of steroid hormones, and progesterone is the most common in human females. And then the calciferols, or calcitriol, these are um, derivatives of vitamin D um, and have, um, uh, there are basically uh, calcitriol receptors in just about every cell of your body. Um, they may activate uh, many hundreds of genes and have um, great consequences for cardiovascular health, for bone health, immune health, um, oral health even. So um, where does vitamin D come from? It's, um, it's not really a, a nutrient, 
Um, some of the vitamin D comes from the sun, so it's called the sunshine vitamin. Um, there are some food sources that provide vitamin D, um, but uh, vitamin D is uh, interacts with uh, some processes in the, the kidney and the liver. It's converted into a vitamin D metabolite or calcitriol. Um, and according to the uh, Endocrine Society, people really need 30 to 40 nanograms per mil in normal plasma levels. So uh, we, we live in a northern climate. Uh, people don't always get all the sunshine they need. Um, if they're older and housebound or um, uh, folks that have darker skin and uh, maybe are all covered up in the uh, summer, uh, um, in the wintertime, uh, may have difficulty making all the vitamin D they need. Um, and people are thinking about this because it's been found that vitamin D um, has some impact on bone health and prevention of tooth loss. All right, now, how do we make a steroid? We have a cell here, and it's going to relieve, it's going to get some kind of signal. It could be a hormone signal. So, for example, there are cells in the ovary that make estradiol. Um, FSH is a protein hormone that's going to bind to a receptor and then tell the cell to make estradiol. Um, so, and there could be a number of, of uh, processes going on in a, in a cell to, to tell it to do that. So we have to take cholesterol. Cholesterol is carried around in the body in the form of LDL. So we harvest the cholesterol from the LDL droplet. Uh, and with the help of the mitochondria and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, there are enzymes that then synthesize the steroid hormone. Now notice that the steroid hormone then diffuses right out of the cell, it's going to find uh, a carrier protein and then uh, travel in the blood. So uh, in this, this picture from your textbook, Vander, also shows uh, synthesis pathways. Uh, and that is shown in a larger version in the next slide. So you see here's cholesterol. And we have a number of precursors. Now, it is not my intention that you memorize all the names of the precursors. What I'm interested in is the general idea that cholesterol can be converted into a, um, another kind of steroid and could has three possible pathways it could travel here. So it could be converted into a progesterone, which then could go to a corticosterone, which is a relative of, of um, cortisol. Uh, and then be converted into aldosterone. So this is a pathway that leads us to a mineral corticoid. The middle pathway takes us to cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid. And then we have a third pathway that takes us to, um, and I have terrible trouble pronouncing this, uh, androstenidione, uh, which is a type of male androgen. This can eventually get turned into um, uh, testosterone in some pathways, and estradiol in other pathways. So why is this important? Why is it important to take into account of these shared biochemical pathways? It's important because if there is a tumor that produces excess steroid, if there's some kind of, of a problem in the biochemical pathway, you will have substrates that are shuttled into other pathways. So maybe the primary tumor or the primary condition causes an excess of aldosterone. However, some of that aldosterone or precursors before aldosterone could be converted into cortisol or could be converted into androgen. Um, in fact, there's a condition where uh, babies are born um, and they produce too much cortisol. And that extra cortisol gets turned into sex hormone. And so that when the babies are born, their gender is unclear uh, because they've had extra hormone that has influenced their um, sexual development. And of course, that's a stressful thing for a parent, um, you know, parents to have a brand new baby and not be able to tell if it's a boy or a girl. 
Um, so excess steroid hormone from one pathway can have impacts on other pathways, and then therefore if you are an endocrinologist, there's some challenges in trying to figure out what's the primary disorder and what are some side effects because of these biochemical pathways. Another example is shown here. Here's our cholesterol, and here's the uh, androgen that I, I, I have so much difficulty pronouncing, androstenindione, and uh, that can be converted into testosterone. Testosterone is a hormone secreted by the testes, and you notice there's an enzyme here called aromatase. Both males and females can produce androgens, and both males and females have aromatase. So females have a lot of aromatase because they can take the male androgen and convert it into estrogens. And uh, when we get to female reproduction, we talk about the follicle. There's the sort of the two-step process of making estrogen. There's a layer of cells that make androgen. They send that androgen to cells called granulosa cells, and they turn it into estrogen. Now, the thing is, males have a little bit of aromatase. Males make a tiny bit of estradiol, make a little bit of estrogen. However, what if a male were to take excess uh, androgens? What if a male wanted to bulk up and hit 75 home runs in a summer uh, and decided to take some androgens uh, to help him grow more muscles? He would also need to take an aromatase inhibitor. If he does not, then the excess uh, testosterone that he takes, some of it will be shuttled into estradiol, and he could then grow breasts, which is not going to be helpful for hitting home runs. So uh, this is uh, um, the problem with uh, uh, taking anabolic steroids in some situations. Of course, it's cheating. And there are all sorts of side effects that happen um, because steroids share synthesis pathways. So let's stop and think about something. Why aren't steroid hormones packaged into secretory vesicles and stored within the cells? So um, many of you have had uh, neurophysiology or neuroscience, and you've learned about neurons that make neurotransmitter, they package it into a vesicle. That vesicle travels down the axon, is stored in the axon terminus, and waits for the signal to be released. Why don't secretory vessels, uh, vesicles form in uh, endocrine cells that make steroids? I want you to think about that question for a second, even uh, uh, pause the presentation and think about that. I hope you've given that some thought. Um, and hopefully what you came up with are uh, the ideas that uh, steroids are lipid soluble and membranes are lipid soluble. And a steroid can diffuse right through a membrane and therefore a vesicle would not hold the steroid. It would be an ineffective means of storage. And as I've told you previously, steroids diffuse right out of the cell. They find a carrier protein. So essentially, we store our steroid out in the blood bound to carrier proteins. So steroids are carried in the blood. So we essentially have a reservoir of steroid hormones. So you have your free steroid and you have your bound steroid. Now, some of the car carriers that... Uh, um, bind steroid and carry them around. Some of them are quite specific. So, for example, thyroid binding globulin is a carrier protein that carries a lipid soluble hormone called um, thyroid hormone, T3 or T4. Um, testosterone is carried by um, uh, sex binding globulin, um, uh, oh, excuse me, sex hormone binding globulin. Uh, there's cortisol binding globulin. All kinds of steroid hormones have specific carrier proteins. However, some of the carriers are sort of all-purpose general carriers. So albumin is a very important protein synthesized by the liver, responsible for 
um, what we would call oncotic pressure or protein osmotic pressure. Not only does albumin serve this purpose in the capillaries, but it's also a very important steroid carrying protein. Keeping in mind, however, the free hormone is biologically active. So essentially, there's an association constant or a binding constant for steroids to bind to their uh, carrier, and the steroid then has to unbind so it can diffuse into its target cell. So steroids are long-lasting. Because they're bound to the carrier, only the free hormone can go into the liver to be broken down. This extends its half-life. Not only that, but the more lipid-soluble the steroid hormone is, the, the more avidly it binds to its carrier, the more it's shielded from degradation, and the longer it, its half-life. As a matter of fact, you could take a graph on the x-axis, plot the lipid solubility of a hormone. On the y-axis, plot the half-life, and you'll see a linear relationship. The more lipid soluble, the longer the half-life. So, uh, for example, the half-life of estradiol is 13 hours. So, uh, I like to play around with my paint program. So here I have a blood vessel, a capillary. I have a protein hormone, and that protein hormone can leave the capillary. It's going to bind to an extracellular receptor and have its effects. And of course, we haven't covered proteins yet, but we're getting there very shortly. So it's not uh, shielded anyway. Uh, it's uh, fully exposed to any uh, um, degradation enzymes that are found um, uh, throughout the body, and those, uh, those enzymes are found everywhere. That means protein hormones don't stay around very long. They have a short half-life. Now, here's the concept we've been talking about in the previous slides. Here, my little blue triangle is the steroid, and the large red uh, sort of polygon here is the, uh, is the carrier protein. This carrier protein is shielding the steroid from degradation. However, the steroid has to unbind from the carrier so that it can diffuse into the cell, find its receptor, and that receptor is inside the cell. And that's where we're going next. So in order for a steroid to work, it has to find its receptor, and that's going to be inside the cell. Um, so sometimes they're in the cytoplasm. Many times they're actually in the nucleus. And the free steroid diffuses into the cell. It finds its intracellular receptor. And the complex, the receptor and the steroid together, act as a transcription factor. And they guide uh, or uh, repel, basically, um, access to the promoter region on a gene. So um, if the uh, hormone is going to increase transcription of a gene, then it makes it easier for RNA polymerase to find the promoter region on the gene. If it's going to inhibit the production of proteins, um, and, a, and certainly an example of that is cortisol. Cortisol is anti-inflammatory. That by repressing the expression of genes that would lead to inflammation. Either way, uh, uh, the hormone and its receptor is going to determine if RNA polymerase can make it to the promoter site and transcription can happen. So then we make an, a messenger RNA shown here. That's the transcription process. Messenger RNA goes out in the cytoplasm, interacts with the ribosomes. We have a translation process, and we make new proteins. And then the new proteins are responsible for the cellular response. Now, it takes time to make proteins. So steroids are long-lasting, but they're slow-acting. It takes time to see the products of gene expression. However, whenever you think life is simple, you realize it's actually quite complicated. Um, most steroids, well, all steroids in some respect, work through gene transcription. However, more recently we have seen steroids and lipid-soluble hormones having an effect in a matter of minutes. Uh, what does this imply? Well, it might imply that 
the steroid hormone is working through faster mechanisms, non-genomic mechanisms that might involve uh, second messenger systems. For example, uh, progesterone uh, has been shown to have an effect on calcium. Um, increasing intercellular calcium inside sperm cells, helping them to swim better. Well, a sperm is a non-transcribing cell. So if progesterone is having an effect on a sperm cell, it cannot be through gene transcription. Sperm cells don't transcribe. So there's a, a really exciting new things happening in, in regards to um, how steroids actually might have other receptors that they work through. All right, what about our other category of hormones, peptides, proteins, and glycoproteins? So proteins dissolve well in blood, so they don't need a carrier. Uh, they, they, they go very well all over the place in the blood. The thing is, they're not shielded, so they're broken down very quickly. And there are peripheral enzyme systems throughout the body, and people are trying to figure those out. So um, there's not a lot in your textbook. I don't have a lot to tell you in that regard. Uh, because these um, these topics are still being researched. But here's a couple of examples. Growth hormone is a peptide hormone. It has a chemical half-life of 20 to 30 minutes. So in 20 minutes to a half an hour, half your, grow your growth hormone is going to be broken down. Now, do you remember what I told you a few slides ago? The half-life of estradiol is 13 hours. The half-life of... Uh, um, T3, which is also a lipid-soluble hormone, is, I believe, 24 hours. So 13 hours, 24 hours for lipid-soluble hormones. Here we are with a water-soluble hormone. This half-life is 20 to 30 minutes. Now, look at epinephrine. Epinephrine is an amino acid derivative. It's, we wouldn't call it a, a peptide, but it has a lot in common with the peptides. It's water-soluble. It's working through a second messenger. And look at that half-life. Two minutes, very short half-life. And uh, what we know about pepti peptides, proteins, and glycoproteins, that they're working through second messengers. So they bind to a cell, they activate a second messenger system, they have a fast action, but they don't stay around very long. So here's an example of a second messenger system. Here's our receptor, here's our first messenger. Our first messenger is going to be the protein. Um, so glucagon uh, binding to its glucagon receptor or insulin binding to the insulin receptor or growth hormone binding to the growth hormone receptor. And here we see that when the ligand is bound to the receptor, there's a, a heterotrimeric G protein, undergoes some changes, activates an enzyme called adenylylcyclase, which catalyzes the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is then our second messenger turning on cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase, sometimes called protein kinase A. Kinases are enzymes that phosphorylate things, and when we phosphorylate them, we either turn them on or we turn them off, and then we change the kind of reactions that are happening inside of a cell. So second messengers can do a lot of things. They can affect transporters, they can open and close ion channels, uh, they can release calcium from inside uh, uh, an endomembrane system, they can turn on some enzymes, they can turn off some enzymes, they can um, uh, regulate the microtubule uh, system inside a cell, and all of those things are going to be fast. However, please note that a second messenger then could uh, turn on a transcription factor, and then we could have some gene expression. So again, life gets messy. We think of protein hormones as working through second messengers and being really fast. That's growth hormone. Growth hormone works through a second messenger as, and has some fast effects, but growth hormone also increases gene transcription factors and can have longer term effects. So the shorter the effect, the more likely it's happening through a second messenger. The longer it takes, the more likely it's happening through gene transcription. And both types of hormones can do both kinds of things. However, that said, most of the time a steroid is working through G 
protein transcription. Most of the time, a peptide or a protein is working through uh, second messengers. Now you might say, why in the world would we use a second messenger? Why do we need all these pieces parts doing all these things? What does that do for us? Well, one of the things it does for us is this process called amplification. So here's our first messenger binding to the receptor. We activate adenylyl cyclase and we produce these cyclic AMPs. And these cyclic AMPs then turn on some protein kinase A's. And then these phosphorylate many, many enzymes. And then the enzymes produce many, many levels of substrate. So we started out with one first messenger, and now we have a million uh, substrate products. So amplification is really powerful, and it's exactly why we don't need very much hormone. Hormone concentrations in the blood are very teeny tiny in the, in the nanomolar concentration range. That's why we need special tests to pick up um, hormone concentrations in the blood, something like a radioimmunoassay or an ELISA assay. And we can get away with these little tiny amounts of hormone because of this process of amplification. So big thing with peptides, they're fast, they work through second messenger systems, and they can have really big effects. You give somebody epinephrine, boy does their heart rate go up, boy does their, boy does their blood glucose level go up in a matter of seconds. All right, now it's not just about hormone level, it's also about sensitivity. And the sensitivity of a target tissue or target cell is related to the number of receptors that you have. So upregulation means you're increasing receptor number, and as a result of having more receptors, increasing tissue sensitivity. I'm not talking about changing individual receptors. I'm talking about more receptors and a more opportunity for hormone to bind. So an example of upregulation. We have a beta adrenal receptors. These bind the hormone epinephrine. And these receptors that bind epinephrine are upregulated in response to T3, which is one of the forms of thyroid hormone. As a result, there are more receptors in the heart because of upregulation. That means the heart is more sensitive to catecholamines. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are examples of catecholamines. And therefore, the heart's more sensitive to epinephrine in the presence of thyroid hormone. So here's a little diagram. I have a target cell with four receptors and plenty of ligand, but, but only four can bind. If I upregulate to eight receptors, now eight molecules can bind, and the cell is more sensitive to the impact of the ligand. Now... In addition to upregulation, we have downregulation, which is a decreased receptor number and a decrease in tissue sensitivity. So there can be a downregulation of growth hormone receptors with chronic stress. If you're chronically stressed, you need your energy and your efforts to go into survival. You um, are going to limit your growth. You want to survive as opposed to growth. So when you downregulate the growth hormone receptors in the presence of chronic stress, then the body is less sensitive to growth hormone. So here I am again with my target cell and my four receptors. If I downregulate to two, now only two molecules of hormone can have an effect on the target cell. And thus the target cell is less sensitive. Now, hormones can interact. Uh, and they can interact in a number of ways. Permissiveness, synergism, and antagonism. We're going to concentrate on permissiveness, but I'm going to tell you what these all are. When a hormone is permissive, it means a hormone has to be present. So here's hormone A. Hormone A by itself does some job. I've got some target re response. So hormone A does some job. However, hormone A, in the presence of the permissive hormone, does a much better job. The permissive hormone isn't doing the job. Not doing the job. But it has to be present for hormone A to do its best job. 
Okay? Now, a synergistic effect, we have two hormones, hormone K and hormone J. They both do the job. But if they do the job together, oh my goodness, their, their response together is greater than the sum of their individual responses. Example here is uh, FSH and testosterone or FSH and estrogen. Um, they, uh, they both promote um, gamete production, but they do their best gamete production when those two hormones are together. Um, and we can, we can get back to that when we, um, in later presentations when, when uh, I talk about reproduction. Finally, antagonistic effects. So you have some response. Um, a hormone Y uh, increases something, and a hormone X decreases something. So um, glucagon raises blood glucose level. Insulin lowers blood glucose level. So the one I want to concentrate on is permissive effects. So in this, so I got my A's and B's a little different than the previous slide, but uh, A hormone is the permissive one. B hormone does the job. B's the one doing the job, but A needs to be present for B to work fully in, in regards to some function. So insulin is permissive for growth hormone to cause growth. Cortisol is permissive for glucagon to raise blood glucose level. So insulin isn't causing growth. Growth hormone is causing growth. But insulin needs to be there for growth hormone to work fully. Glucagon raises your blood glucose level. But cortisol needs to be there for glucagon. So here's another example of permissiveness. It's actually related to, uh, to the upregulation example I gave you a little bit, a little bit ago. Thyroid hormone, T3 and T4, thyroid hormone is permissive for the action of catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, on adipose tissue. Now, thyroid hormone is lipid soluble. It binds an intracellular receptor, causes gene transcription, synthesis of new proteins. And one of the proteins that is made are beta adrenal receptors, so beta receptors for epinephrine and norepinephrine. As a result, the beta receptors are upregulated, and the target tissue is more sensitive to catecholamine. So here we see this diagram. Our x-axis is time. Our y-axis is the amount of fatty acids released. So here are little adipose cells, and they're full of triglyceride. And there's a process called lipolysis in which a triglyceride is broken down into glycerol and, and free fatty acids. So when fatty acids are released, we know the cells are undergoing lipolysis. So thyroid hormone does not cause lipolysis. And very little happens with thyroid hormone. Epinephrine does cause lipolysis. Epinephrine binds to its beta receptor and tells the cell to break down the triglyceride. And you see free fatty acids being released. However, if thyroid hormone is present, and we upregulate the beta receptors, then the cells are much more sensitive to epinephrine, and epinephrine has a much greater effect. Thyroid hormone is permissive for epinephrine to work on adipose tissue and cause lipolysis. Thyroid hormone is also permissive for epinephrine in the heart. So epinephrine and norepinephrine increase the heart rate and contractility. And we haven't gotten to this yet, but contractility is the squeeze of the ventricles, giving you a, a nice, good ejection of blood. So thyroid binds to intracellular receptors, increases the synthesis and insertion of the beta adrenergic receptors. So what do you think is going to happen? If thyroid hormone upregulates the beta receptors in the SA node, where the heart rate is determined, and the ventricular myocardium, where the size of the squeeze is determined, what's going to happen to the heart rate and contractility if we have a thyroid hormone and epinephrine? I'll give you a moment to think about it. Maybe jot down some thoughts.
the heart rate should go up. The contractility should increase. And even if there's no increase in epinephrine, more thyroid hormone and more receptors and a more sensitive heart will increase this, this effect. In fact, sometimes people get a surge of thyroid hormone. Their beta receptors go up and their heart, a person's heart can just be beating right out of their chest. They feel their heart beating. It's called heart palpitations. And their heart is racing and their heart is pumping and they go to the emergency room because they think they're having a heart attack. And that's not the problem. The problem is they have too much thyroid hormone. So upregulation is often a way that permissiveness works. We have some other examples of permissiveness. Um, instead of upregulation, sometimes the permissive hormone does something that the other hormone needs. So, for example, insulin increases the uptake of amino acids through a facilitated diffusion transport. Growth hormone then performs protein synthesis. So making more proteins supports the growth. Growth hormone will stimulate protein synthesis, but it will do a much better job if insulin is helping providing the amino acids for that protein synthesis to occur. Therefore, insulin is permissive for growth hormone in causing growth. Insulin doesn't make you grow. Growth hormone makes you grow. But insulin makes sure that amino acids get into the cell so growth hormone can make them into proteins and then you can grow. All right, now another critical thinking. Type 1 diabetic. Uh, this is a condition where an autoimmune disease destroys the endocrine pancreas. And you get to less than 10% of your cells that make uh, insulin and the person's got diabetes. Well, consider a child that, that has diabetes because of this autoimmune disease, and um, their production of insulin is low. They have to take insulin, and they're taking the insulin based on blood glucose level, not based on what they need for amino acids. Think about how this individual might be affected. And I'll, again, I'll give you a minute to think about it. I hope you're thinking about the fact that insulin is permissive for growth hormone. If an individual is not able to produce their own insulin and is taking insulin based on blood glucose level, it's possible that the ability for this person to take amino acids up into their muscle cells so growth hormone can make the muscles grow, that that process will be impaired. And therefore, it is not unusual for a child with type 1 diabetes to be short in stature and compromised in lean muscle mass. And that's, the, of course, the importance of diagnosing the, um, the insulin and um, having good regulation. And of course, now, um, instead of uh, simple injections of, of insulin, um, there are development of insulin pumps so that people can have more reliable uh, insulin production and uh, glycemic control. And, um, and that's all, all to the good in helping individuals um, grow and be healthy in the face of having diabetes. Okay. My last example of permissiveness, cortisol and glucagon. Sometimes we don't know why something is permissive. We just know it needs to be there. And cortisol is permissive for glucagon to raise the blood glucose level during periods of fasting. And the way we found that out is that people that are compromised in terms of making cortisol have a disease called Addison's disease. And they don't have enough cortisol um, as, a, as, a, as a person without a, a Addison's disease. And therefore, cortisol is, is not present for glucagon to raise the blood glucose level. So let's come to our, our critical thinking exercise. 
if cortisol is permissive for glucagon, what would happen to the blood glucose level if cortisol were in short supply or hyposecretion of cortisol? Can you see that glucagon would be less effective? Can you see that that person would have hypoglycemia? Furthermore, there's another disease called Cushing's disease. Those folks have too much cortisol. They hypersecrete cortisol. What do you think is going to happen to them? They're going to have hyperglycemia because, in essence, the excess of cortisol is making glucagon work too well, raising the blood glucose level too much. So the interactions of, of uh, hormones are really a big part of endocrinology. All right, class. Uh, I thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I hope you're finding it helpful. Write down your questions and email them to me or, um, or bring them to class. Uh, our next topic will be talking about how the hypothalamus, the pituitary interact, and uh, how peripheral hormones are regulated by negative feedback. Um, so uh, I look forward to seeing you all in class and uh, keep up the studying, keep up the good work, and I'll see you next time.